Thank you very much, Mr. Otis, for your letter and giving me this opportunity of having a story printed in your magazine. Well, I try and start at the beginning and then bring you right up to date with my present activities, making pop records for the commercial market. Um, I was about five years old when I first wanted a gramophone, and it was one of those toy gramophones with a celluloid sound box and a key to wind it up. And I remember I'd seen it in the shop window and I'd asked for it for Christmas. And as quite often happens, my wish came true and I got this gramophone for Christmas with some children's records. Well, I used to play this all the time and it was quite obvious to my parents that this fascinated me. And when I was seven years old, they bought me a proper gramophone. Uh, the portable type uh, that used to be very popular about, well, 20 years ago. And um, uh, at this time, uh, I used to be fascinated with uh, making things out of shoeboxes, like puppet shows and slot machines and all sorts of things. And uh, I used to try and experiment with my gramophone, and I discovered if you play the record at the end on the run-out groove, you could shout down the sound chamber and the sound would be imprinted in the grooves. And I thought that I'd discovered something marvellous. And of course, I was really doing just what uh, Edison had discovered years before. But anyway, this became not only a hobby, but uh, it used to take up most of my time. I used to go around old records shops in Gloucester and old sales room and buy up lots of gramophone records, a lot of which I still have at home in my attic. <laughs> I'll tell you more about that later. Anyway, uh, this went on until I was about 13 years old and uh, discovered uh, that uh, it had changed over to, I wanted a magnetic pickup which I connected to the gramophone and uh, uh, then I discovered uh, that I wanted to amplify this, and I, I made my first one-valve radio. And then, of course, my one-valve first one-valve amplifier. And by the time I was about 14, I'd sold my treasured possession, a cine camera, and had bought my first amplifier, £7.10, I remember. And the war was on at this time, and uh, I used to play records for dancing too, mainly bit of Sylvester and different things, uh, different records that were very popular then. And I think this is when it be uh, I began to get an ear for the type of music the public liked, something with a good, solid rhythm and uh, with a tune forced home. And um, I also naturally began to collect a lot of radio gear and and I soon found that my entertaining with gramophone records became very popular around Gloucestershire and uh, I was in pretty big demand. Uh, at one time, uh, to such an extent that I used to have to employ some other friends of mine, uh, to operate gear, say on an August back holiday they would be at Huntley, I'd be in Gloucester, and somebody else would be at Newins. And um, uh, say this, by this time I was about 16, I used to provide music for amateur dramatic societies. I remember a plays like The Ghost Train and uh, uh, Oh, The Portuguese, and lots of plays and I used to go out of my way to provide the right sort of music for them and the right sound effects. Uh, my father was an estate agent and naturally wanted me to to be the same, but uh, I, my head was always in radio books and audio books and uh, uh, so they used to let me work in a radio shop in my spare time. And then I went in the forces when I was 18 and uh, became a radar mechanic. And my two years in the RAF was taken up by learning as much as possible about radar. And also I was pretty happy around the camp at repairing radios and uh, 
uh, record players. When I came out, uh, in the meantime my father had died, I decided that I must take the plunge and move to London and take a job uh, connected with recording. Because during my time in the services, I'd experimented with wire recorders and uh, uh, disc cutting. And uh, this really fascinated me more than anything else. And so I came to London and took a job for one week in a, a film dubbing room, which I must say I disliked because there was nothing creative in it. And I left this to take a job in Stone's radio shop in Edgware Road. And uh, I kept this job for two months. 